Thank you so much. Well, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I'm uh, uh, going to tell you a few stories. I've, I've been founding companies for a long time. Uh, and if you look at the record there, you'll see it's a pretty mixed bag. Um, but, you know, my uh, 35 years later, my Palo Alto AI software company, I know what went wrong in 1984. It's not going to go wrong this time. Um, but I do note one common thread to all the things that went wrong, and that's me. Uh, so some of my messages are about customers and how difficult they can be. Uh, if we could be it'd be a lot easier if we didn't have customers uh, and would last a lot less long. Anyway, uh, I want to start, I'm going to tell stories about a couple of companies. First one is iRobot. Is Helen still here? Helen? Helen, I can't see you there. Hel it is Helen. So we started iRobot as a space exploration company back in 1990. That's pictures of us then. Helen told me about three years ago that she and Colin, who were 22 at the time, thought I was impossibly ancient at 35 when we started the company. Um, so it was a space exploration company. I'm not going to go into the whole details of that, but we're going to have advertising on the moon and send stuff, and we had plans and business plan. As, as, as uh, Vinod says this morning, business plans aren't worth anything. We launched some stuff. It did soft landings. And as a result, it turned out, we, not us, but NASA sent uh, a rover to Mars in 1997. It was a project that Colin and I had started at JPL. Uh, Helen had been at JPL at the same time. So we had sort of, sort of a success, but it wasn't really a business, and we didn't get any money at all out of it. In fact, Colin has this list of 14 failed business models that we went through. Um, <clears throat> but eventually, in 1992, uh, no, in 2002, 12 years in, uh, we had our, uh, two successes in 2002. The first one was Roomba, which went on sale on September 18th, 2002. It was not the world's first uh, uh, home vacuum cleaning robot. The first one was Electrolux, the Trilobite, which was selling for 2,000 euros. We had sent someone to Sweden to buy two of them, surreptitiously, bring them back to the US. We pulled them apart to make sure that what we were building didn't... Um, uh, violate any of their patents was totally different from it because we knew that we would get all sorts of paper sent at us the moment we went on sale, uh, and, and we did. Um, but we hadn't violated any patents. We made ours so that it could go under the kickboard in kitchens. Theirs couldn't. But the real innovation was that we had gone around and asked people how much they could get away with spending without their spouse getting too mad at them. <laughs> and it was $200. So $200, we didn't build the robot and then price it at $200. We started with a spreadsheet with $200 in the bottom right-hand corner, and everything worked back from that. And I, um, yeah. Um, so disruption, that low price, $200 compared to 2,000 euros, can create markets. Uh, and uh, the iRobot home business is over a billion dollars uh, a year business still, and Colin is CEO. But it took us a while. This was the very first prototype vacuum cleaner uh, we built uh, in 1992. Helen and Colin and I, I don't know if you remember Helen, we hand soldered the boards. You know, remember those little 6811 boards there in the top there? It was a really bad design. It sucked all the dirty air past the computer boards. But uh, <laughs> 2002, we came out with this. Um, that was 16 years after the paper with the essential idea. And it wasn't really, I think, till 2013 uh, that the, the, the Roombas really got good. They had self-cleaning brushes. They could deal with pets. They could deal with cords and stuff. So that was, what was that, 27 years from the original paper to, to getting out there. Um, and I realized later that the reason the Roomba was successful was not because it was a great cleaning robot. It was who it was competing against. It wasn't competing against human cleaners. It was competing against uh, people who didn't clean their apartments at all. <laughs> so it only had to take out a little ball of dirt once a week and made an incredible change to their lives. So that's just a lesson. Compete against no one is much better than competing against someone. 
But we, you know, we didn't do things right. We were engineers, and our user interface had the standard symbol for a computer on off for the you know for uh, uh, tower PCs back in those days. It had a rocker switch with zero and one on it, and uh, it had this SML. And the consumers had no idea how to switch the thing on or off with that zero one. What does it mean? Um, what does SML mean? Oh, well, that's for a small or a medium or a large room. What's a small room? What's a medium room? What's a large room? So you can see over time how the user interface, and this is critically important. I think tech people don't worry about user interface enough, but you can see the user interface evolved over time to the bottom right-hand one, where there's simply a green button that says clean. <laughs> That's it. And, and uh, you know, as tech people, we say, how could they be so stupid? But we all get uh, frustrated with bad user interfaces, and they abound in tech. Uh, so. By the time Helen and Colin were much older than I had been when we started, we eventually did do an IPO, so that was a, that was a really good day. But as we grew, we were faced with all sorts of challenges. We had to restart our distribution in Ch Japan, I think, three times. Um, the appearance of the product was really important. We didn't get that. Um, Europe, European Union, every country had different laws on chemistry for batteries. That was just a horrible experience, getting this, and every country had different distribution. So a lot of, of pain in growing the business. And this is a picture of how the Roomba operated, wandering around, cleaning the floor. And the consumers, the, 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 those customer people, they didn't like that. Why is it going random? And you know, if you read that, about the three, three lines from the bottom, I think it should hug a straight line back and forth across a room like normal vacuuming or lawn mowing. That's not how normal vacuuming works. You go like this, right? And that's important because you go across the nap of the car carpet in different angles. But the consumers, the customers wanted straight lines. Okay, straight lines. So eventually, this is after I'd left the company, using VSLAM, um, I robot brought out there. Um, uh, I think this was 900 series, I don't remember, with a visual slam looking at the ceiling and went in exactly straight lines back and forth. And then the reviews were, well, it doesn't work as well as it used to. <laughs> no, because random is good. But that's what the customer wants. And back in 2002, we also uh, had success with our military robots. And is Aaron in the room? Aaron Hoffman? Yeah, you were. Aaron was part of this for many years. Um, and again, user interface, our MIT engineers built you know, the user interface that could do everything. Uh, out in the field, that didn't work so well. What did work a whole lot, a lot better was uh, uh, Game Boy uh, interfaces. Because you know, every kid, every 19-year-old kid in the army had 10,000 hours on them. Uh, <laughs> Now, our engineer said, yeah, but they can't do, you know, task 27B3. Before, they couldn't do any tasks. It made a big difference. It made a tremendous difference. So think about the customer. Really think about the customer, even if you think that, but anyway, think about the customer. Now, we had those failed business models before. Number six failed business model was, uh, cell nuclear power plant inspection robots. We worked, we were funded, we were the first foreign company funded by Japan's MITI, Ministry of International Trade and Industry. For three years, we worked with um, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries on nuclear power plant inspection robots when eventually they said, ah, we don't really need them. Then on March 18th, 2011, we got a call. This was seven days after the great tsunami. Uh, and uh, we had robots in Japan 48 hours later. Uh, trained TEPCO, uh, went into the, uh, there's the world's biggest Roomba, by the way, in the middle top, uh, but went into the power plant and uh, helped shut it down, which I think was one of the best things we ever did. This is me. Can you see me back way in the middle there? Way, way off in the distance. Uh, in, in China, in 2003, I think I thought at the time, I don't know if it's true, but I took the, the photo taken, the largest collection of robots in one place ever. There's two robots per, per box there. Not going to Japan, by the way. That's not good enough boxes for Japan. Um, <laughs> so we were building, uh, and, and iRobot still does manufacture in China, uh, mostly by hand, people building robots by hand. And, I was, we were having, we were starting to notice 
labor shortages in China by 2005. Um, with my work with CSAIL, working with many of our sponsors from um, based in Taiwan who had manufacturing operations in China, I was really starting to hear that there was going to be a real labor shortage in manufacturing in China. So I thought, OK, how can we put robots in there? I'm a robot guy. Every, every problem, solution's a robot. Um, how can we put robots in there? I realized we couldn't do all the jobs, so we couldn't use conventional industrial robots where there are all robots and no people. But instead, we had to have robots that could work side by side with people. So I started Rethink Robotics, and it looked like a pretty soft target, um, industrial robots. They had terrible user interfaces. You had to put them in cage, cages. The cameras came separately. You had to buy them separately. You had to add integrators to do everything. So we decided to do it all. Uh, oh, and get rid of these terrible scripting languages. Terrible scripting languages. What I noticed today as I looked at it, that looks a lot like Python. Ugh. Anyway, <laughs> none of the modern user interfaces. So we started building um, a collaborative robots. And is, is Elaine here, Elaine Chen? Yeah, Elaine was head of engineering. What? She, oh, there's other people. Yes, yes, Alex. Uh, there's a few uh, uh, people from the company. Sorry. Didn't see. Anyway, um, trained by demonstration rather than programming so that factory workers could get the robots to do tasks because it was going to be mixed. It wasn't going to be all engineering and then robots. Um, and with regular software updates. I asked someone at Mitsubishi uh, a year and a half ago who are the biggest uh, PLC manufacturers how often they do software upgrades. They said, oh, yeah, we do software upgrades. We aim at three upgrades every 20 years. That's the a little different from what modern tech is. So uh, we did that. We, here's here's this, actually the second generation robot. I'll just let it uh, show you how it works here. It's putting something in. It's, it's using force to align it in this uh, uh, machine that normally a person would load. Um, and it interacts with the machine without um, uh, having to have interfaces built. It interacts with it the same way a person interacts with it. it you know, if a person has to slide the door shut, for it to work, the robot slides the door shut, and a technician can train the robot to do this. Um, and we had, this is our first generation robots, Baxters, working in factories close to people. You see on the right, left hand image there, there's a person in the gray t-shirt with his back to the robot. Don't do that with a conventional industrial robot. Got rid of the, uh, the code, and instead, a technician could just show the robot what to do. But we got a lot of complaints. Customers said it wasn't transparent. 65 people for three years. We had a new software system, which is a complete transformation of how robots are programmed. And as, if you read the robot report today, you'll see a story in there about how this software is now being used in other companies. Um, uh, when we had a certain philosophy of how our robot should be used by those pesky customers, um, and uh, uh, using force feedback, et cetera. And so we came up with a set of um, metrics that we said were important on the right. And they said, don't, don't forget your old metrics. They're not important. These are our metrics. These are important. And the customer said, yeah, well, but we want the ones on the left. And we showed them that you don't actually use the ones on the left. Use the ones on the right. No, but we want the ones on the left. No, but you don't have to do it that way. We want the ones on the left. So we did the ones on the left, built a second robot. And the cost per arm went from $12,500 per arm to $29,000. The seeds of our destruction were there. Uh, this is from last year, the startup graveyard <laughs> ranked. Uh, left column first, right column second, ranked in the amount of money lost. We only came second, but we didn't commit any felonies. <laughs> We're the first amongst non-felonies. Thank you.